sorry. He's a disciple of John Main, who brought Christian meditation to the UK many years ago. Lawrence is based at Bonvaux, a beautiful retreat center in France near Poitiers. Very easy to fly to from Stansted, I can guarantee. I've heard Lawrence speak on many occasions, and I can guarantee you all a very interesting talk full of wisdom, which I'm sure will stay with you for some time to come. So over to you, Lawrence. Thank you, Valerie, very much. I will be careful of what you guarantee. <laughs> Read the small print. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for your invitation to be with you, and uh, I'm very happy to share this time with your community. And uh, I hope it is it is uh, useful. The I know your theme uh, for this year is listening, and the theme for our uh, WCCM uh, community this year is metanoia, that your minds be remade. And uh, there's a very definite uh, correlation between those two central New Testament themes. So I'd like to uh, share with you what uh, we have begun to reflect on as one of the aspects of metanoia. Uh, in this idea of conversation. And this uh, translation of Philippians 3, chapter 3, verse 20, which is from the King James Version, our conversation is in heaven, always used to puzzle me because I thought he was imagining people sitting around having a cup of tea uh, in the heavenly realms. Uh, talking about how good the weather was always every day and how happy everyone was. But um, it's a different meaning of the word conversation than we're, than we're used to. And I think it opens up a, a lot of insight into the meaning of listening and the meaning of, of conversation. Uh, if we just look at that word, for a moment where, where the word comes from. Um, I was alerted to its importance for our time by the person who gave the John Main seminar this year, actually here at Bonveau in November, Herman Van Rompuy, um, whose uh, theme was democracy, the challenges of democracy and the challenge to democracy in our time. And one of his key comments, which uh, struck me uh, powerfully was put in a few words, conversation is the lifeblood of democracy. Conversation is the lifeblood of democracy. And if you think about what that means in terms of how we communicate, how we, uh, talk with each other on, on the radio or on the internet or in social media, we can see just how, how important that insight is. And social media in many ways and sometimes in very extreme ways has lost the art of conversation. Uh, and it, ha it has forced us to lose the art of conversation even sitting with people on a train or uh, sitting with family and uh, or with friends or community members. Um, social media has become very much a shouting match and it polarizes people in different camps, pro-Brexit, uh, uh, anti-Brexit, pro-Trump, anti-Trump, and pro-Russian, pro-Ukrainian, and so on. So. Democracy is never going to have unanimity. No group of people, no community is ever going to have unanimity for more than a few moments. Uh, and there will always be differences of opinion. Uh, and of course, compromise, learning to adjust to each other with respect, with generosity, 
uh, is at the heart of all human living and civilized behavior. So this is a very important topic for our time because we are really seeing democracy being undermined very dangerously and uh, in many, many parts of the world. So what does conversation then, where does it, where does it take us? I'm a, a Benedictine monk and one of the vows I took uh, at my profession was conversion, conversion of life is the way it's translated very often. And it was for many years um, before the scholarship uh, on the rule was, was a more advanced as it is now, uh, it was thought that the word was con conversio in Latin. But then it was discovered that it was conversatio, Conversatio morum suorum. One of the things that we can we promise to do is to commit ourselves to an ongoing conversion of life, which is more than just a conversion of, uh, you know, from from being a Christian or from being a non-Christian to being a Christian, or from one denomination to another, or or from one political party to another. Um, it's more than just about specific moments of change or you change your opinion or you change your, your group. It's more than that, much more than that, because it's about ongoing. It's about, in other words, metanoia. Metanoia, which is the first word, well, in, first instruction that Jesus gives when he begins his public teaching is repent and, and the kingdom of heaven is close at hand, repent and believe the good news. Now, the word that is translated as repent is the word metanoia. And metanoia doesn't mean feel guilty about what you've done wrong or beat yourself up because you're not as good as you should be. But metanoia means a change of mind, literally a conversion of the way you see, perceive, think, and therefore act. Because the way we act is determined by the way we see things and believe things and understand things. And it's quite uh, common that we don't see things accurately. Think of, you know, Arguments within a family, for example, that can go on for years, decades, where one member of the family or member of a community uh, have, have a fixed idea about what somebody said or, or did. And I remember actually giving a retreat many years ago to in a, in a, a convent, actually, and the, one, one of the people I spoke to said to me, uh, there was sort of talking about what was on their, on their conscience and so on. And they, they said um, there was one member of the community that they had not spoken to for 20 years. And, and uh, this was clearly a, a burden on their soul. But I said, what was the cause of the original disagreement? And the person I was speaking to looked a little embarrassed and said, well, I can't quite remember. <laughs> but we just don't like each other. So a conversion a, 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 in this sense, a, com, a turning around of the way we see things can be painful. A very good example of this, if you, if you like Jane Austen, is her book, uh, Emma. At the end of Emma, you have uh, a, a perfect description of just how painful it is to be disillusioned. She, if you remember, was convinced that uh, she's a, a bright young thing and she's a, trying to arrange everybody else's lives and marry them off to the people she thinks they should marry. And, uh, and then at the end, when all of her stratagems collapse, uh, she realizes she just didn't see things for what they were. She made big 
big errors of judgment and perception, despite being so clever. And the biggest thing she didn't, the, the biggest mistake she made was to under, was to realize who she loved and who loved her. Now, because this was Jane Austen, it has a happy ending and everybody marries who they are supposed to marry and they are, we suppose, happy ever after. But uh, it's a beautiful, painful description. And for a moment, uh, Jane Austen is not a comic writer, but a, but a tragic writer because she's showing just how uh, much effort, uh, how much it costs for us to undergo metanoia, to see things truly, or to have uh, the eye of the heart open, we might say, the eye of wisdom opened. St. Augustine said that the whole purpose of the Christian life is to restore to health the eye of the heart, whereby God may be seen. And by that, we could understand whereby reality, truth, can be seen. So the word is conversatio in Latin. And um, it actually doesn't mean having a conversation in the ordinary sense, just having a chat. It actually means living among living among others, familiarity with people, even intimacy, keeping company with people. And conversare means to turn around, because if you're living with people, and I see several couples here who may have been living together for many years, uh, you could, you could uh, speak very eloquently, I'm sure, about the need to turn towards the other and to turn together as well. So this is at the heart of the meaning of conversation. It's not just about exchanging our thoughts or feelings. It's about a whole way of life and a way of perception. Now, that's the Latin word conversatio, which gives us the word, our um, modern word, conversation, but we can see that conversation here uh, is about a way of life. Conversatio morum suorum means you change the way you live continuously, day by day, with every breath. And that's our inward renewal. That's what it means to be on a spiritual path. Now, there's a Greek word. Um, of course, behind this in Philippians chapter three, and it's typical of St. Paul, uh, I gave some talks on St. Paul uh, last year online, and um, in uh, rather typical of St. Paul, he will mix the sublime and the mundane almost in the same breath. So he's talking about First of all, how people in community can live together and how we can share that life with others. And then he can move, you know, from telling people to stop bickering and to, and to learn to listen to each other with love, uh, how to forgive and how to stop jealousy and, and pride and all of those problems, uh, he can turn from that in an instant to really see the mystery of Christ that is at the heart of these, of daily life and of our daily relationships and interactions. And he, he, he's making a distinction between the, the Christians who, who live with this awareness of Christ in their midst and therefore can draw on this presence of Christ among them and their faith, common faith in Christ, to live together in a um, in a loving way, basically a civilized way. Um, and they, he contrasts that way of life with the way of life of you know the the pagan world, which 
which is basically about survival and exploitation by contrast. So he's talking about people who are heading for destruction, their appetite is their God, their glory is in their shame, their minds are set on earthly things. We, by contrast, we, by contrast, have our conversation in heaven. As King James Version, King James Version puts it. In the New English Bible, which is my preferred translation, it says, we, by contrast, are citizens of heaven. Citizens of heaven. And the Greek word is polituma, which means citizenship. It has you know, other meanings like form of government or the way a community is organized. Uh, the verb uh, that comes from it means to live as a citizen. And it refers to all of those networks of relationships that make up a society or a community or a family. And we're very conscious today in our kind of culture, how um, the volunteer sector, for example, is a real sign of the health of the, of the wider community of, and of society in general that people are organized in a volunteer basis to, to come to the help of others in need and or to enjoy social, cultural or intellectual um, enrichment together. That's what we're doing here. Uh, so your, your community is, a, is, a, is, a, is an example of that, of polituma. And this is at the heart of St. Benedict's idea of the, of the monastic community. So in other words, what we have in this word conversation, or which is citizenship, tells us how to live. And that is different, as St. Paul was aware, different from the way we are conditioned to live in our very individualistic, competitive, and lonely society. I, I've noticed over the years how, uh, you know, uh, how language changes when you're traveling. Um, when I first started to, to travel, um, I realized that I was always being called, uh, I was being called a, 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 a traveler. Uh, you know, or thank you for traveling with us, or thank you for the, uh, what was the other word, um, maybe a passenger. But it was, it gave you a little bit of sense that this was an adventure you were on, you know, you were traveling from A to B, but it had this sense of, of, of an almost mythical sense of being on, you know, on a journey. That's changed. You aren't a passenger or a traveler anymore. You are a customer. Doesn't sound quite so good, does it? Can you imagine Odysse Odysseus being told he was <laughs> he had customers on his ship with him uh, as he went through his his adventures? So we've replaced consumerism with citizenship. Individuals have taken over, our individualism has taken over from that polituma, that connection we have in familiarity, living with others, familiarity and intimacy with others, working with them. We become consumers, more and more isolated. And everything in our technological civilization at the moment pushes us into greater uh, individualism, individuation. Well, not really individuation. So that's what I think it, conversation implies, and that's also what it implies citizenship. But remember, it's citizenship in heaven. Our conversation is in heaven. That's where we can meet each other as equals. 
And this is, this is one of the most remarkable uh, insights, really, or discoveries of the of St. Paul, for example, and the early Christians. They lived in a highly stratified society with a slave class and not much, not, not many human rights, as we understand them. But there's this, this famous uh, insistence on St. Paul uh, that we all have one master. We may have different social roles, but in the light of the gospel and in faith in Christ, we are equal. We are equal. Our citizenship is in heaven and the kingdom of heaven, and and Jesus Christ is our is, is our is our master. So I think this phrase conversation in heaven or citizenship in heaven has a, a lot to say to us about how we're living today and how our faith, our Christian faith, can contribute to the health of society. Which brings me then to uh, what are the elements of a conversation? First element of a conversation is confidence that you can speak your mind, that you can speak freely. And a society, for example, like Russia at the moment, where you're, or many other countries, where you're not allowed to speak your mind, is a very unhealthy society. Freedom of speech is a, is a, dangerous, uh, a dangerous freedom, but it's, if we don't protect it, we, we will uh, suffer the consequences. So the first quality we need for a conversation is what the New Testament actually calls paresia, which is a boldness and self-confidence and the courage um, to speak freely. The second element of a conversation, of course, which makes it a conversation rather than a harangue, where you're just shouting at somebody, the second element is humility and the self-control necessary to listen, to listen to what the other person is saying. And in that listening, that turning towards the other, conversation, turning towards the other, you are able, with practice, you are able at least to see how they see things. You may not agree with them, and you don't have to abandon your own opinions, but for a moment at least, you can see what they see. And that, those are, that's what I think conversation means and why it takes us into the deepest uh, meaning of our spiritual journey, which is, which is prayer and the prayer of the heart. There are many forms of prayer, all of them are good, and we should never criticize another person's way of prayer, we should always respect it. But in its wisdom, the Christian tradition has created a kind of a model of prayer, which you could express like this. It's a wheel, and the different spokes of the wheel are like the different forms of prayer. Lexio, scripture reading, uh, worship, Eucharist, uh, devotion, um, petitionary prayer, intercessory prayer, charismatic prayer, Ignatian prayer, and so on. All many different forms of prayer, pilgrimage. And um, many young people would say, well, and exercise and, 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 and coming to the help of people in need. So these are, these are all aspects of prayer. But all of these forms of prayer converge in the center or the hub of the wheel. And what do we find at the hub of the wheel? We find, we can put it in two ways. We find the mind of Christ. Christ and the prayer of Christ, the conversation 
that Christ is in with his Father. That's what we mean by the prayer of the Spirit. So Paul says, we don't know how to pray. Actually, it's the Spirit who, who knows really how to pray. And what we can do, as St. Teresa said, in prayer is to, is to prepare ourselves to be led into the prayer of the Spirit. So, if that is true, we need to look a little bit more closely at what we find at the center of the wheel. And at the center of every wheel, you have to find stillness. Because the wheel, and so I can do this, the wheel has to turn around the axle and the axle has to be still, has to be firm. Be still and know that I am God. So we could say then that at the heart of prayer and what the early um, monastic mothers and fathers of the desert called uh, pure prayer is stillness. And a stillness not just of the body, but a stillness of the mind. And a stillness of the mind that it also is uh, reflected in silence and simplicity. The three qualities of contemplation, stillness, silence, and simplicity. So a quite practical question is how do we develop, deepen, and practice that stillness of mind and heart. And this is where, if we go back to the teachings of the desert uh, mothers and fathers, what we find is a teaching on how to meditate. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, replace or um, conflict with any other form of prayer. But if we listen to what these great teachers who have given us some of the foundations of Christian spirituality underlying all of the different schools of spirituality that make up the Christian tradition, I think we find something very important for us in, as individuals, but also for us as contemporaries living in this noisy and isolated world. What John Cassian, who, who was a fifth century monk who, who, who brings, brought the wisdom of the desert to the Western church. What Cassian tells us in his two great conferences on prayer, nine and 10, is what he identifies as a way of prayer that was practiced in the desert widely and which had its origins in the apostolic church. So in other words, right back to the, to the roots. And this is the way uh, of, of Christian meditation that some of you, maybe all of you will be familiar with. And what he says is the, 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 the big problem we face is our restless, noisy mind, which is filled not with one conversation in heaven, but a million different conversations. Memories, plans, anxieties, worries, fears, daydreams, fantasies, uh, anxiety, all the rest. Constantly going, and we're all over stimulated by stuff that we listen to on the media all the time, plus our own internal conversations and monologues. So the first thing we discover when we sit to be still, to meditate, is that our minds are anything but still. We are, it's as if we've lost the art of conversation in heaven. Conversation in heaven, in this sense, is silence, stillness, and simplicity. So Cassian says, how do we bring this restless mind to quiet? 
and he recommends taking a single verse or word or phrase or mantra, as John Main calls it, and to repeat this word continually in the mind and heart during the time set aside for meditation. I think we need to look at those times of, of the day when we meditate as if they were appointments we had to give a friend or a relative a phone call and have a chat with them. Now, and it's, it's something we, we do as part of our daily life and it's, uh, it makes us feel better. But it's not having a chat in the ordinary sense of just telling God what's going on in my, in my day and he better hurry up and answer some of my prayers, otherwise he may be in trouble. Uh, it's not that kind of chat. You could have that kind of chat at another time. But at the time of meditation, we, are, we have the courage to say this word. which will bring stillness and silence to the mind. And it's then uh, able to lead us into that silence, which enables us to listen to the silence of God. And God communicates with us perfectly well in silence. We don't need to get ticker tape messages or text messages or any other kind of locutions or revelations. The fullest self-communication of God is in silence. As Meister Eckhart said, there is nothing so much like God as silence. And that's the contemplative conversation in heaven. I think that uh, St. Paul is urging us to, to make the foundation of our lives. So to set aside these times of silence, stillness, simplicity, where we do the work, the humble work of saying our word is what opens us to this wonderful reality at the center of the wheel of prayer, which is the prayer of Christ in us. So if you like, we could take just a, a few minutes before and I'll give you a break from my monologue <laughs> and um, we could just take a, a few minutes uh, to meditate and I'll just I'll just describe how we describe and uh, this way of meditation and we just describe it in the same way to six-year-old children or to people on their deathbed, or to adolescents going through a crisis, or uh, you know, people running a, a business in these economically difficult times. So it's the same simplicity at all ages, really, and in all conditions of life. So the first thing we do is to sit still with our back straight, because meditation is a very incarnational way of prayer. Our whole body is involved. Close your eyes lightly. Just be aware of your breath for a moment, your constant companion through life. Just be aware of the breath as the gift of life. Of course, the word for breath in many ancient languages is, this, is the same as the word for spirit. And as you give your attention to your breathing, you are taking the first step into meditation by taking the attention off your thoughts. Meditation is not what you think. As Cassian says, in this time of the prayer of the heart, we lay aside all the riches of thought and imagination. We don't repress them. We don't fight them. We just lay them aside. And we lay them aside 
by returning continually to our word, our mantra, our prayer word. And the word I would suggest is the word Maranatha, four syllables, Maranatha, Maranatha. Let's just take a few few moments uh, for that to practice that together.
Good. So let's end uh, with these words again from the letter to the Philippians. Do all you have to do without complaint or wrangling. Show yourselves guileless and above reproach. Faultless children of God in a warped and crooked generation in which you shine like stars in a dark world and proffer the word of life. We, by contrast, are citizens of heaven, and from heaven we expect our deliverer to come, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is near, have no anxiety. Good, well, thank you. Would anyone like to share any thoughts? Or... Thank you very much, Lawrence. Um, as we are a large group, um, if anybody has any comments or questions for Lawrence, could you either um, put hands up emoji or just wave and uh, Louise and I will say your name and then you need to unmute. Val? Oh, thank you, uh, Father Lawrence, for that. Uh, very, very relevant today, particularly here in the UK, where communication has so broken down. Uh, and there are so many strikes taking place because mm. public sector workers um, have got such a grievance and government are taking a very firm stance and not sitting down and talking. So, yes, it's so very relevant. Thank you very much for that. Mm. Well, maybe the day will come when you're in the middle of in the middle of a, a strike and one party won't sit down with the other, but it won't be so strange to say, well, okay, we won't have to um, we don't have to have we don't have to talk yet, but we'll come and sit in silence together. Maybe the day will come. Angie? You need to unmute, Angie. I was very struck by um, several of the words that you use, but the one that most struck me was having self-confidence. And it's very often quite difficult to see what a what are the right conditions for expressing what you believe in a world where you can't take for granted that people will have any of the same assumptions about reality of the existence of God and our, our own desire to share what we believe is most important. I think what I have found is that we can be very or almost clear what it is that we believe, but on the other hand, we can be a bit muddled. But how do we communicate with people who you use the thing of language used, how can we be sure that the language that we use is going to be in any way a real communication of what is most important? So I think that's my question, this question of language. Yeah. I think, well, language is often shaped by where we where we're speaking from 
And you know what's very depressing? I, I, I listen to the, although I'm living in France, I, I follow the BBC news and I, I listen to the, to the, 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 you know, the interviews with politicians and so on on the, on the news. And what is, what is so depressing and sad is, is when they blatantly <laughs> don't have the courage to answer a question. And everybody knows they're not answer, answering the question, which makes them look idiots and makes them, uh, you know, <laughs> reduces your trust in them anyway. And yet they just, why is that? I think it's because they're terrified of, of uh, maybe being exposed to having made a mistake. And you know how difficult it is for them to say sorry. And yet, uh, I think that's, that's what has destroyed the currency of language in public, public discourse and political, political uh, interviews, political conversation. We just, we just don't trust them anymore. Because they're not, they don't have the courage to tell the truth. And I think, uh, I remember, uh, that can also happen, you know, in a community where there's a time of sharing or in a family, a time of sharing, a family conference, a community chapter meeting, and uh, you asking, you go around and ask people to say what they're thinking or think about a particular issue. And sometimes you, you, you can see the same, it's very sad when that happens. The same sort of fear of, of just coming out with it. And I, by contrast with that, I remember some years ago, I was taken as a guest to a AA meeting, 12 step program meeting. And I was, I felt I was, I felt this, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, as, as uh, Jesus calls it. Uh, it was so powerful in the room as the, the men and the women there were talking about their, maybe their most shameful, vulnerable, painful experiences and weaknesses and and the difference was, was amazing because there was a real power of truth and love in, in that sharing. So I think, uh, I think we, if we could have the courage and maybe it's something that could be taught in, in school and, uh, but it also needs to be respected in, by the uh, journalists and the, and the media people who are just, you know, looking for things to pounce on um, but it takes it takes courage and a certain and a lot of integrity I think to tell the truth especially if it exposes you vulnerably and I think if you did uh, and it's the same with us you know talking about matters of faith or well, for example talking about meditation we have many wonderful teachers of meditation in our community all over the world. And I think they don't go in to give a talk to a group, to a new, a new group with the pretending to be an expert or pretending to be the best meditator among them or anything like that. In fact, I, I, I often recommend, you know, advise them to say, you know, I really believe in meditation and I meditate every day, but I'm a terrible meditator. And that immediately creates, a, you know, an honesty and a humility and a, 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 a mm -hmm. connection with people. So, and I think meditation, you know, having this experience of what is, what is at the core of our being, what is at the center of the wheel, what is in our heart, that experience of uh, Christ's presence, um, which of course he said was, he said, you know, when you are hauled up before kings and emperors, don't worry what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you what you have to say. 
So it's it's when we feel that uh, presence of the spirit in us, it's it's much it's much more likely that we will speak in a way that builds confidence. And uh, it doesn't mean you have to, you know, <clears throat> make a general confession of all your faults and, and sins, but it means that you you are open about your about the fact that you don't know everything and but you may have learned something from your from your mistakes and you're not you're not frightened to admit them i mean coming from that place makes the language different i think i don't know if that makes sense but Any other questions or comments for Lawrence? Thank you, Catherine, Riley. Catherine and Anne for Catherine first. You need to unmute Catherine. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for coming and giving your time to us. It's really, really lovely, very valuable. Um, I have often been asked admittedly by people who don't necessarily practice meditation, um, how they can understand it when they feel that you're blanking your mind, that it's not um, an intelligent or progressive way forward. How do you answer that kind of comment? Um. Well, that phrase, blanking your mind, is a, is a very common one in, in the evangelical world. Yeah. Uh, especially, I, I, you, you hear it, so there must, there must be some, uh, um, some books or, uh, or a standard, you know, way of refuting meditation uh, to, to condemn it as a kind of blanking out of the mind. Well, what I say is, well, you try meditation and see how difficult it is to blank out your mind. <laughs> First of all, it'd be great if we could blank out our, our mind. But it isn't, it isn't about that. It's about, it's about making, it's about sitting in 100% commitment of faith. It's total faith. It's the faith of turning away from yourself Jesus said, leave self behind. And how do you do that? Well, you go to the root of, of, the, of, of, the, of the ego and you take the attention off your thoughts. That's what we're doing. And that's what poverty of spirit is. And then I would you know, have a conversation with them about what they think poverty of spirit means. And, and put, put the this interpretation or it's not the only one but put this interpretation of poverty of spirit to them and of prayer you know the teaching of jesus on prayer is very clear go into your inner room don't go babbling on like the pagans who think the more they say the more likely they are to be heard um, uh, lay aside your worries and anxieties Set your mind on God's kingdom, which means pay attention and be in the present moment. Don't worry about tomorrow. This teaching on prayer is, is not about many words. It's about uh, uh, this metanoia or about this uh, um, turning, turning of, of one's self towards, um, towards God. Uh, I, I would, you know, I think a good way of doing it with people who are very scripturally based and, and uh, people coming from that sort of branch of Christianity will often not be very open if you start talking about the Desert Fathers. And uh, uh, the first question that Catholics uh, usually ask is, what does the Pope think about this? And the, the first question that Protestants ask is, where do I find this in scripture? So, um, 
I, I would go from scripture and take a little passage of scripture and share it with them rather than arguing about the, the rights and wrongs, but get into the meaning of a short passage of scripture with them. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, Catherine, there was another Catherine <laughs> in Cormac. Need to unmute. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk about social media has lost the art of conversation. And then later you spoke about an individualistic, competitive, lonely society. And you also said Christian faith contributes to the heart of society. And you've just mentioned and shared with us now. Um, so I'm just thinking, and you also said, you know, silence to listen to the silence of God. I mean, I've experienced and I just wonder how we can move um, forward in this. I go into, I have been going into two schools, primary schools, and uh, they've experienced meditation and they just so like the silence and the children themselves and they continually ask, you know, um, the teacher. But I'm just wondering about, um, I don't know, it's, it's individualistic, competitive and lonely society, how we can kind of bring God into that, basically. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted. Yeah, I, I was... <laughs> in a school recently on a little island, uh, Bantry Bay, uh, it was a school of 20 children. And uh, I've meditated with them before. And it's a, a delight. It's really a delight to meditate with them. Uh, and you're you know, and I, I agree with you completely that children can meditate. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to meditate and they like to meditate. Mm -hmm. And Goodness me, why aren't we teaching it? Yeah. And, you know, I have nothing against mindfulness uh, and these other methods. I think they help a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Great. But I think there is a, and I'm not saying this is the only way, but there's a general sort of feeling among people who may not have experienced meditation themselves that it's too much for children because they think it's too much of themselves. And it ain't, you know, it's quite the reverse. It's easier for children than it is for us. I mean, that's the, that's the thing. So how we, you know, we've really got to work at getting this into the mind of, uh, into the mind of, uh, of, this, of teachers and uh, educational authorities, that mm -hmm. they have this capacity for what we would call real contemplative prayer. Now, one of the challenges, of course, today is that you go into any school, even that little school in a rural part of Ireland, um, I would say maybe a third of the children ever went to church mm -hmm. on a regular basis, apart from you know, ceremonies. And so, and their parents don't practice. I mean, they're not pagans, but they, they you know, they, mm -hmm. there isn't much reflection or, or, or talk. Uh, so I, I think, I don't say keep God out of it by any means, but recognize that God is in it. Mm -hmm. God is in it as an experience. And then in a word or two words, you can help them to identify this experience as an experience of God. But uh, I don't think we should, you know, the days of catechism are over. Uh, in that, you know, in that way, we most of us may have learned catechism. I mean, I I don't regret learning the catechism. I think there's some very good, very good definitions there. But I don't think we can use that approach anymore. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think I think just now to convince the teachers and the principals and the educational authorities. Maybe we need to approach it by speaking about the crisis in mental health of children. Yeah. And in the United States now, mm -hmm. in most schools, as I understand it, the children are given 
what you call those things, instead of fire drills, they're given shooting drills. In case somebody comes in with a gun, what should they do? I mean, my God, what does, what's that going to do mm -hmm. to a child? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we just, we, we have a very solid argument to say that children are facing, you know, eco anxiety, worried about the ecology, they hear all these disaster, disastrous predictions. You know, they, they read about the politicians and they read about the shootings and the war and so on. So uh, it's maybe not so surprising that they just turn off and escape into, you know, their, their iPads or social media. But anyway, I think uh, one of the strong arguments we can give is crisis of mental health and that meditation shows every every verifiable um, sign through research and so on of, of, of preventing uh, children slipping into mental, mental illness or depression or mm -hmm. anxiety and stress. But, and that's God, you know, that is God. <laughs> It's interesting too, though, that uh, it's a Catholic school, but 60% of the children are Muslim. Yeah. It's amazing how they, they enjoy, you know, the meditation as well. They are yes. sorry, but it's interesting how we can extend it, you know, further afield as well. There's, when you're talking about the, the, the Muslims, I know that because it's a little difficult with the, with the Islamic, well, as it is with, the, with any religious group you have, different sort of types but mm -hmm. uh, the Sufis you know the Sufi is the mystical side of Islam mm -hmm. and they have uh, they have uh, their way of meditation reciting the names of God or one of the names of God mm -hmm. in, in very much the same way mm -hmm. as we would maybe they will chant more and do other things but um, I, th I think uh, it's very easy to see that in the main religious traditions, I'm talking about Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, Jews, mm -hmm. and Christians, one of the unifying spiritual practices is meditation in this yeah. way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Lawrence, I um I realize we're just over time. There was one other person with a hand up. Can we um take that question and then sure. we'll come to a close? Anne Bishop, you need to unmute mute. Yeah. No, I one thing that um struck me at the beginning was you said um to be listening with love. Mm. And that really struck a chord with me because it can be quite difficult when you're not entirely in agreement and but the 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 language of love is very difficult yes thank you well i think uh, yes because that's one of the reasons people are frightened to to speak the truth in love is because they might be frightened that the other person is listening to them, but only listening to catch them out or to, or to, you know, catch them out in a mistake or something, you know, something to attack them with. Whereas uh, real listening is try is, 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 uh, is loving because it's giving your attention fully to what the other person is saying. And if you give your attention in that, or you pay attention to someone, then they experience it as love, however they may describe it. And it's so rare that people really listen to you, <laughs> that, that when you do, when, when somebody does listen to them, they can't help but notice it. And, you know, and they, they feel more confident because then they think, oh, well, they didn't jump on me and tell me, you know, what a fool I was. 
uh, you know, they, they were just listening without jumping in with a, a judgment. And that's, um, of course, we have to learn that ourselves. Is mm. to listen in that way is, is loving. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Can I hand over to Angela, please, to say a few words of thanks? You need to unmute, Angie. Father Lawrence, you've, in, in a short space, shared so many riches of your experience and your faith, and you've answered our questions with humility and simplicity, which is what we were urged to do in our prayer. And there's just that one image which you have emphasized, which is the hub of the wheel. and that I'd like to um, take away with me, and I hope other people will take it away as well, that we are looking at the Christ who is at the center of our lives, and that our reflection on the life of Christ and his teachings is going to be the focus, which will help us, in your words, to be simple, humble, and to learn with self-confidence what it is to listen truly. So thank you very much for the time you've taken and the wisdom you have shared. And may you be blessed in this work that you do of establishing better links with the kingdom that is all around us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angela. Thank you all. Thank you. It's been very good to be with you. Mm. Lovely. All most welcome in Bombo. <laughs> I can recommend. Mm. <laughs> I think, can I just say one? One of the wonderful things is that um, what it is that you have to share with us has brought together so many of our friends and connections. And it's very good to see these people again and also some new faces who have joined us in this exploration of our pilgrimage towards the other land. Thank you. Thank you. We we did have a Kate. Do you have the prayer? I think. Did I have a prayer? No, I think you gave a prayer. Was it on the screen? Um. I could suggest a prayer. If you want to yes, please. That would be that would be great. No, I should. Having said that, uh, I should remember it. Wait one minute. Okay. I'll do the best I can. Uh, this is the, the prayer we often end, end uh, some of our events with. Um, <clears throat> and this is a, a prayer for, for, for you as, as a group, as a community, uh, as it is for all, all of us. May this group be a true spiritual home for the seeker, a guide for the confused, a place of welcome, May all who come here, weighed down by the problems of humanity, leave giving thanks for the wonder of human life. And this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Lawrence, and everybody for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.